There we go. This recaps a lot of what you saw in the video, but it takes you back to 1994, and it really represents a big piece of who we are. Uh, our basic techniques were sort of more or less founded there that we still use today. And it was something that was a, primarily where we worked was in Mexico. It was an area called Ciudad Obregón, which was where the Green Revolution started, oddly enough. And um, there's lots of straw. And we can take you a step further. Uh, go ahead, Morgan. Let's go to the next one. So what happened was, this is 1994. We're going to go back one, I think. Yeah, there we go. And it was when we had just finished writing the Straw Bell House book. We had maxed out our credit cards. We'd spent every penny we had. And so the anthropology department at the university locally said, we'll pay you transportation, we'll pay you food <laughs> and lodging if you go work in Mexico. And we said, okay. And we went. Good. On. Next. So what had been done before we got there was that two brothers had built this straw bale house on their own. And um, they were part of an extended family that really became the group that we worked with that um, really sort of defined, well, we worked together, our kids, ourselves, and anybody else that we brought into the project. Next. So when we got there, basically what had happened was that um, all construction <clears throat> had stopped basically because the peso, the monetary you know, unit in Mexico had be devalued and all of a sudden the, the cement became kind of prohibitive in terms of its cost. So everything had kind of stopped because the building you saw just before this had utilized a lot of cement in the process. But looking at this, this was kind of the area that we were working, we looked at this and we said, well, <laughs> we can do better, I think. Next. We drew largely upon and pulled on, um, we were living in an area that was adjacent to the land owned by the Yaqui Indians. And <clears throat> their basic construction used a lot of clay. It used these local reeds uh, that were much like bamboo. They made an adequate substitute uh, for what we wanted to do. So <clears throat> because I had lived and worked in a lot of these areas, they always sort of made a big impression on me. So we more or less transferred a lot of that technology into what we were going to do. Next. So to improve on that little tar paper shack that I showed you a couple of images back, we said, well, okay, let's just take, let's do something as basic as we can. And there weren't any straw bales because it was just the year was over and it was just before harvesting season. So we got somebody to bale Johnson grass for us. We did a foundation out of sandbags. Um, we made the roof out of pallets. You can see the pallet wood uh, at the bottom. And because the bales were of such poor quality, instead of trying to pin the bales, we put the pins on the outside and started tying the bales together like a corset. Next. And uh, let's see, this would be, that's our uh, second son, Oso, who uh, you can get an idea of where they started. We did a simple earth floor in there. Uh, we got local gravel. Mm, yeah, next. And you can see here, we started doing well, then, it, this is the early stages of the plaster that we did. In here, you can see the pins showing through the, um, through the clay on the bales. The mats on the ceiling were um, mats made from the same reeds, flattened by the Yaki people, uh, easy to acquire in that area. 
next. So ultimately, this is how this little house turned out on the outside. Uh, it was primarily a lime plaster with a tiny bit of cement. We used uh, the inside was equally nice. Um, it was a huge jump and <laughs> we spent the extra, the last, the very last $300, I think, that we had to um, make this thing happen. All right, next. So that sort of springboarded into a whole series of projects after that. Um, we this uh, <clears throat> we started working with Save the Children Foundation, and they took that basic building as an opportunity to sort of try and replicate these in uh, other parts of the community. So we did maybe two, three more of these. Um, by the way, that's Michael Smith, who's was one of the early Cobb people here in this country, who's from uh, Emerald Earth in California. And he was, uh, he and others, I mean, many people came into this stage of the project at this point. Uh, next. So you can see sort of, you know, it was somewhat of a, an evolution of the first little building that we did. We used, I think we used strapping on that first one for that matter. And um, we, we graduated beyond uh, pallets into, um, we found a cheap source of local poles. I mean, one of the biggest problems of working in Mexico is just almost, there's zero wood. Uh, it's, well, at least in the areas, in the desert areas where we were working. So it was not a practical material for people. So we had to come up with something else next. The other thing, I mean, we were sort of exploring materials and one thing that they'd been impressed with based upon uh, a, a little experimental block that we made was uh, mixes of the light clay straw. So after doing, you know, a series of those uh, simple straw bale houses, they wanted to try the straw clay. And um, you can see the formwork. I mean, part of what we got out of working with these guys was not just they were using our ideas. It was truly a collaboration of thinking and um, we evolved it together. But those are panels the size of old washing machines that were bolted together for that formwork. Essentially what happens, they took a look at this and they said, no, it's not working. <laughs> We're not gonna do this, it's too much. The average person isn't gonna replicate that. So next, um, after that conclusion, we came back and they were already in the process of turning that into adding enough clay to make a block. And so this project now had grown into building an office building for Save the Children. They wanted to use a lot of these. So anybody could come make these for about a peso a block at that time. Uh, so you can see, I think probably in this big, you know, open space in this community, they made about 7,000 of these things. Next. And we still use those to this day. I mean, it's probably one of the easiest ways to make an earth block. It's not a compressive block. But this was the beginnings of this office building, which essentially got sketched out on a napkin. We had one of these brothers that we were working with that was truly, I mean, in terms of engineering brilliance, uh, could sit and design anything in his head. So this was basically simple um, third world Mexico construction a few concrete columns, and then we start fitting the bales in between. Okay, next. So <clears throat> we had, <clears throat> by this time evolved, you'll see some images later, but it became sort of a spin-off of those blocks of the straw clay mixes. Um, it be turned into a very high fiber, uh, clay plaster with tons of straw in it. So it was very easy to teach people. The crew that was really working on this were a group of primarily high school kids out of the local community. Next. 
And some really, truly <clears throat> innovative things came out of this, mainly roofs, because again, going back to the lack of wood that we could use for things common like trusses and what have you, this is um, basically the formwork and the ceiling for, there are three layers of these reeds all tied together, cross-hatched. Next. And then <clears throat> at this stage, besides the, the women were involved in the plastering, but at the same time they came into spaces like this, this room for, this became the library for this organization. So they came in, they built seating, benches, shelves. Um, next. And we relied on, we used an incredible amount of, whoop, back. Mm, there you go. These are all local clays, except for the floor. <clears throat> we found there was just a rich variety of colors in that area the reds, the yellows, there were grains, there were all sorts of things. So it was like this massive playground to experiment with these materials. And um, good, okay. You see the beautiful ceiling on these. There's two rooms we did this way. It was like weaving a basket, basically. I mean, the whole building from the bales to put in the external pins, you know, which we still use today. Um, we never, we've incorporated those into the structure of buildings. These are all lime plasters. Um, we did a certain amount of it and learned a whole lot about it in the process. This is all frescoed color, um, concrete floor, acid stains. Next. Here's a little variation of that same kind of vaulting technique. Those are little concrete beams that are <clears throat> normally manufactured to fit together with uh, foam panels. And we just kept using, we used the reeds over there as well and put a different mix on top. Next. And there you can see the yellow clays that were used in that room to finish it out. A lot of these we did... Um, Basically, it was a three-step process. We used the high straw clay um, plaster to fill out the walls, shape them, kind of a sand and clay you know, middle coat. And then most of the office we did with paints uh, made from clay. On, next. This is this is a little different spin-off. This is the biggest room in the office, a meeting room. It's twice the size that you see here. And so they came up with a system of using concrete beams that they poured, and then we plastered over all of them with the uh, local brown clay. Next. And it's all built around a central courtyard. I mean, abundant with plants. We pulled in, uh, we got a lot of palm supplied to us for the thatching on the roof. Um, good, next. And the whole area, I mean, the use, the combination of plants, the thatching, the colors, the clay, um, were just marvelous together. I mean, it's an incredible space. To this day, I think it's probably, it has its faults and, and weak points, but one of the best things we've ever done. Next. And you can see other rooms. I mean, smaller rooms, individual offices, different, you know, we use different roof techniques, different colors. Um, uh, you're good, next. And then this is an example. This is one of the early carvings, I think. If I think back to carvings Athena did, right, early back on, this is one of the early ones. And we were using more, we were carving more at that time, lime uh, over clay. So, you know, we put the clay plaster, and then a layer of the lime, which we would fresco and then go ahead and cut it back to whatever design was being incorporated. Next. And then what happened as a result of all this, uh, 
when we were just about wrapping up the office building and ready to sort of return back to a lot of our work in uh, here at home in Arizona, which we really neglected because from, be from beginning to the end of all this, it took us about six years going continually back and forth. There are a group of people that were primarily women that came from sort of a segment of the population living um, adjacent the city dump. Uh, and that's where they, they would pull things out to resell or food that they would eat. But they also wanted to do um, these buildings. So by then we'd found a little bit more lumber to use. This is probably the last building that we did with them. But 12 women went on. And Athena said in the video, you know, we helped fund them to go on and help build each other's houses. Next. So you can see, I mean, it's pretty basic. You get the elevated stem wall, termites, clay and straw fill, the reeds that we cut off later. Um, next. And so <laughs> there were no mixers. I mean, out in this area, there's no electricity. Everything was difficult to acquire. But um, for the mixing, we would, you know, the women would all get together and we uh, arranged a bunch of 55 gallon drums, uh, barrels cut in half and put on stands. And <laughs> they would all get together in mass and mix the plasters. Um, next. Heck, oh, there we go. And sometimes there were bathtubs, uh, the kids. I mean, there was no limit to who worked on this thing. And I think one of the brilliant things was that um, everything that got evolved got evolved in a way that anybody could do it. You could bring all age levels, all genders into this process. There was nothing that complicated. In some cases for the roofs, there was, you know, obviously uh, heavier concrete work, uh, which <laughs> can be, well, as most places in the third world, extremely difficult and, you know, hard physical work. Next. So more or less, we were using the broken up concrete, mostly off of floors that we would find cast outside the city. And we pulled that together for the foundations as well as the floors, we use it like flagstone. And there you can see um, the adjacent building that's filled out with these completely with the shape of the strong clay. Later, we, we covered that with lime, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Go on, okay. So this is typical. This is <clears throat> how we ended up actually Finishing the, the outside of the office building, but we also did these buildings with lime as well. It was a great education in lime, let me tell you. Um, we even brought a fellow named Jeremy Sharp all the way over from England, who has a lime company, I suppose he's still in existence, to really help refine the slaking of quick lime and you know, trying to get everything right. In the end, um, I would say basically there's a lot of climatic factors when you get into the use of lime. And I think the biggest hurdle that we're up against in this part of the world is uh, dryness during the hotter times of the year. And consequently, you don't get good adhesion. There's a lot of, pro you know, it's difficult. So um, we've thought a lot about it uh, since then. This is one that has been frescoed. Um, and we also did, interestingly enough, on the outside of the office building where we had this um, lime finish, we frescoed it with a local red clay, uh, not just a pigment. We really diluted it down to give it the color and it turned out to be beautiful. Okay, next. Here you can see the <clears throat> one of the things that we ran into was sort of architectural preference. And I mean, obviously our choice would have always been um, somewhat of a reasonable overhang. These were all shed roofs. And in this case, you see the little, you know, the use of dimensional lumber that we could get rough cut, not in mass, but enough for these buildings. And um, 
but people would always want parapets. Uh, there was, they didn't want overhangs. They wanted it to look like typical construction in that area. And that was, we tried according to their wishes to bring the lime plasters up over the roof top of it and cover the straw clay mixes that we were making and seal it. And in the long run, you can just say in short, it just did not work. Um, next. So sort of exploring further um, the, the roof problems, we thought, well, let's give it a shot for experimenting with domes and, and with vaults, to which we did several. Um, we brought in a number of you know, specialists for this. We, um, people to help train us. We brought a consultant from John Norton who'd been working extensively in Africa. And again, what you come back to is you come back to a level of difficulty that in trying to help people that are living, you know, with very low levels of income, um, they can't replicate it. I mean, maybe, but with time, and slow and so again next these were lime plastered by the way there's one of the vaults that we did um, it's just too complex it's again it's doable but slow and not really accessible to you know just anybody who's out there um, next see if it ends there next yeah, I think that's it. So anyway, that's kind of where, I mean, that's that's very much who we are today. Not a lot has changed outside of that. Um, we still remain, <laughs> we still put the pins on the outside. We still use the straw clay plasters. We still make the straw clay blocks. I mean, all that goes on in our lives today. And without those people, um, wow, I mean, we wouldn't be who we are because – there's not enough photos in there. It's too short a program to really talk about that. But really, it was a whole amazing process altogether. So that's the roots of who we are as a Canelo project. Okay, Tom. Brilliant. Uh, well, I'll give you I'll give you a round of applause now, even though you can't hear everybody else um, of our audience across the globe who are who are joining in. Um, 